Welcome to Epicenter Bitcoin, the show which talks about the technologies, projects, and startups driving decentralization and the global cryptocurrency revolution. My name is Sebastian Couture. And I'm Brian Fabian Crane. On July 10th and 11th, we were in London for the Coin Summit Conference. This two-day event gathered approximately 250 investors, entrepreneurs, and developers to discuss some of the most important issues facing the Bitcoin and cryptocurrency ecosystem. This episode features a panel discussion called The Challenges of Operating a Bitcoin Business in Europe. Peter Smith, Chief Operating Officer of Blockchain.info, Mark Lamb, CEO of CoinFloor, and Frank Schill, CEO of Cefello, provide their insights on some of the challenges of operating a Bitcoin business on the old continent. These challenges include regulatory compliance, establishing banking relationships, and establishing trust with consumers. The panel is moderated by Adam Vaziri of Diacle. I'm Adam Vaziri, I'm moderating, I'm a, I'm a lawyer for digital currency businesses and uh, I mean part of, part of what my experience is is to assisting businesses in Europe with the challenges that they face. So today, I mean I apologise, it's the last session of the day so we're trying to keep you awake as, as much as we can. Um, so bear with us. Um, so we're going to look at, the, get some insight from, from businesses operating within Europe. What are those challenges like? Um, what in the foreseeable future the, the challenges will look like um, to give you an insight and share that insight with you. So we can start, we can start with Peter from, from Blockchain. Maybe you want to introduce yourself and say, just give it a bit of an insight as to the kind of challenges, the key challenges that you face as a business and we'll go across. Sure. Well, uh, my name is Peter. I work at blockchain.info. We're the most popular provider of Bitcoin wallets to consumers. We also provide a uh, block explorer as well as enterprise APIs. Pretty well known in the space. Um, Nick Carey, our CEO, is supposed to do this event, but he's sick, so he sent me. So you're gonna have to bear with me. I don't really do these events. This is kind of Nick's thing. So uh, so I might struggle. Um, our key operational challenges are mostly along the hiring front. Um, it's quite hard to hire well in the Bitcoin space, particularly because. Most developers that have a very strong background in cryptography and security, yep. as well as building financial technology, as well as having knowledge of how the Bitcoin protocol works, it's a very small group of people, and most of those people are already doing their own projects. So there's probably an extremely shallow pool of actual true development talent in this space, which means that you have to hire very, very far in advance. So you have to hire maybe two out of three of those attributes, and then you have to wait for them to come along. So one of the key things that we're focused on is building out a pipeline there, as well as encouraging more knowledge of these kind of skill sets within the overall development community. Which is a positive thing in a way, because that shows that you're scaling up, but the resources aren't there to address you. It's not a, in a sense, uh, it's a challenge, it's a positive challenge. Yeah, there's, there's worse challenges to have for sure. Yeah. Um, but I think one of the things is moving the industry from kind of a short-term time frame where it's like a quarter at a time to thinking about how you're scaling and building as an industry and as a company over a year time frame, to a two-year time frame, to a three-year time frame. And so it's exciting to be at a place where we're maturing in that respect. Brilliant. Frank, yourself, and maybe a little bit about yourself. And yeah. Yeah, maybe a key piece of news. <laughs> a key piece of news, yeah. Uh, so we're a Stockholm-based exchange, uh, started locally in the Swedish market. Uh, and then uh, over the course of the year, we started actually one year ago exactly when we were uh, at Coin Summit and decided to start the company there. So that's a good, <laughs> but it's one milestone. So maybe there's a startup here that's about to start. Exactly. Uh, <laughs> that's how we started. We, we actually came here last year to find, okay, we're going to do it. And we did. Uh, and now a year later, we, we expanded more into Europe with 11 countries, 87 banks for direct payments. So we're not a peer-to-peer -peer exchange, but more a broker where we execute to the market when we get an order in. Um, and we've got investments from, from uh, Nicholas Carey and Roger Ver uh, behind blockchain.info, uh, as well as Eric Voorhees and uh, Ira Miller, who's also here in the audience from Coinapult. Uh, and today we can announce that we got uh, another heavyweight on board with Barry Silbert, who invested uh, $250,000. Congratulations. Uh, so we're quite happy with that. So we got all the check marks uh, in place. Uh, and we're just getting ready for the next phase for Cervello. Okay. 
So what would you say is your, has been your principal challenge yeah. operating a broker, brokerage for Bitcoin? Unlike most companies in Europe, I think we've had more luck on the regulatory side. We have a registration with Finansinspektionen, the Swedish uh, regulatory body there. Uh, harder time on the banking, although we have one uh, of the top four banks in Sweden on board. Uh, but that's definitely the biggest challenge, to get the banks on board. Uh, and it's, it's a back and forth, and some are more receptive than others. Uh, but we're, we've been lucky to through, get the PSPs on board and get the direct payments in that way. Uh, but the direct bank relationships are, are the hardest to obtain. I mean, it's interesting because, you know, uh, Pamir was just mentioning that there was a Swedish exchange that had all of their banks shut, but yet you're still surviving in this climate. I mean, yeah. a piece of news like that must cause ripples. Well, we had, we had some calls from the bank director that calls up <laughs> when something happens in Sweden, it's like, uh, hello there. Um, but overall, we've been able to be a trustworthy. I mean, we, we started as a counter movement with the company, hence the name, we're your safe fellow, um, really to be a compliant company. And ultimately, that wears off to the banks you're working with. Uh, so it's a trust relationship, and, and they uh, luckily trust us, and we, we, uh, we are really, really happy with uh, working with them. So, brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Mark? Tell us all about CoinFloor and yeah, the challenges that you have faced. Yep, so uh, I got into Bitcoin in 2012 and basically uh, we, formed the, we formed the team in uh, April of last year and the first thing we did after kind of pooling, pooling the founders' funds was to uh, go after the regulator and see what they thought about Bitcoin and, and apply for a PSP license um, to, to set up shop. Um, they, they kind of said, well, we, we believe Bitcoin isn't money. We don't want to regulate you. And, and they sent us a letter explaining their position. And, and we took that and, and started setting things up. Uh, we've launched three months ago, roughly. And we've just integrated faster payments. So that's been kind of a big hurdle we had to, had to get over. And we've, we've just gotten that. And also, we just announced um, today a funding round and bringing on of Adam Knight, who is formerly managing director of Credit Suisse and Goldman Sachs, and so he's coming on board. But uh, it's, it's been good. It's just been basically a challenge of getting UK customers to kind of shift their trading from other exchanges to the only pound sterling exchange. So you're talking more of a business challenge as opposed to a systemic challenge? Well, the systemic challenges have been, uh, for, for us... The, the FCA hasn't been as much of a challenge other than their decision not to regulate us, which ha- the, the main challenges have been banking. Um, so it's been very difficult to find a bank account. Uh, we're now working with a, a financial institution, the Isle of Man. They've been amazing. Um, and and, and they're, they're very bullish on Bitcoin. Um, but the regulatory side, other than this decision not to regulate us, they haven't been interfering too much. We're... We're a bureau de change registered with the HMRC, so we're we're compliant with all AML law, AML regulations, and and we're we're very focused on being as compliant as possible and being as trustworthy as possible. And we're, what most of what we've been doing, or a lot of what we're doing, is focused around trust. So, on the on the financial side, but also on the Bitcoin side, um, we believe that we're we're essentially regulated. But we should be treating the blockchain and the Bitcoin aspects as regulated by the blockchain and regulated by cryptography. So we're the first exchange to do provable solvency. We're the first exchange to hold 100% of client funds in cold storage and multi-signature uh, separate vaults. Um, so we've never held all the keys in kind of one place, and we don't ever have to hold customers' keys in, in one place or in one person. Okay. Um, but, yeah. yeah. Maybe just... Just to give a bit of an insight, because obviously you set up your business, it's been a year now, hmm. um, and Mark, how long has it been, um, approximately, since you set up? Since, so we incorporated in April last year, and yeah. we've launched about three and a half months ago. Okay, okay, so, yeah. so talking about a year-ish. Yeah. Give us an insight of how long it took you, in particular Mark, to obtain a bank account, and what that experience was like. Well, um... It's, it was you, basically roughly four to six months, depending on how you count things, uh, to, to get our first, our, our initial banking relationships. Obviously, we had operational accounts, 
much quicker than that that we could operate under, but to get accounts to actually hold client funds, that took um, six months. We've approached every major kind of UK high street bank, um, turned down by all of them. Okay, let's just pause for a moment. Yeah. You approached every major UK bank and you were turned down by all of them. Probably a number, a high number of other banks as well. The, the, the interesting thing about the UK banking sector is that you can, you can talk to a very innovative bank and they might really like Bitcoin. You can get to the CEO, you can get as high as you want. They might really like Bitcoin. Their compliance officer might say, hey, we're actually okay with this and we're totally willing to do it. But when that bank agrees to bank you, they clear through one of the top 10 banks. And so one of those top, even you can talk to, well, I won't, I won't name any names, but there are a lot of banks that are very interested in banking Bitcoin companies in the UK. And they clear through Barclays or Lloyds or HSBC or RBS. And because they clear through those banks, if they start accepting Bitcoin companies, those banks will shut down their accounts. And so this, this is actually a problem that goes beyond Bitcoin and goes into PSPs, at payment services companies, and um, financial institution, remittance companies, and financial institutions in general in the UK, where they, there was a consolidation process after the fines from Barclays. So that, sidetracking a little bit, but other than Bitcoin, the UK banking sector has had some, some problems with dealing with financial services. Those, those problems are looking like they're going to get solved soon by some other players or by some existing players, but it's, it's, been, it's been quite a challenge. Yeah, and I mean, I can relay my own experience yeah. advising businesses. They're good to go. They've got startup capital. They're ready yeah. operationally. Everything's in order, but they're just waiting for that bank account. And that is, you know, the gatekeeping, uh, the gatekeeper for operating a Bitcoin business. Even regulated firms are getting their accounts shut down and not being able to go anywhere, and some are just shutting down operations that aren't dealing with Bitcoin at all. So th- this is a big issue for the UK. And uh... So it's a challenge that I think everyone needs to be aware of, if you're, especially if you're setting up a business within this, um, within Europe. I mean, Frank, your experience has been, let's say, quite exceptional from a European perspective. Um, uh, to give an example of that, in the Netherlands, where I was at the National Bitcoin Conference there, um, I know there are like 17 different Bitcoin companies, and they are coming together, doing their own regulatory part, just to, because all the regulators shut them down, uh, and the bank shut them down as well. So it's, it's a very, very complex situation there. But also in Sweden, uh, we know of several startup companies that are trying to obtain bank accounts, uh, but haven't been able to do so. so. Because there's a capacity, let's say, of risk that the bank can accommodate, you know, they, to a certain degree. I mean, they're not going to take on 50 exchanges. No, so they're very picky, which is yeah. a, a smart thing to do. But uh, like what Mark says, they, they're very uh, conscious about the, the wider ecosystem for them. Like, what if we take a Bitcoin company in? Yeah. Uh, and what does it uh, tell to our, our, our network of banks that they work with? Uh, and that is a big concern and, and one, yeah, uh, logically, uh, yeah, that exists. And I don't know really how they're going to counter that. But let's drill down a little bit As deeper. Well, like, Sorry. Yeah, like for me, I've been going to these conferences for several years now. And we, we kind of talk about this at every conference, how hard it is for Bitcoin businesses to get a bank account. Mm. But the overall trend is quite positive. Um, you know, years ago, no one had a bank account. And if they did, it was because the bank didn't know they were a Bitcoin company. Um, now you have banks that are specifically seeking Bitcoin clients, like you know we heard from Fidor Bank earlier. Um, there's banks uh, throughout the world that are very accepting. Uh, we deal with a variety of exchanges that have extremely strong banking relationships. Um, you know, multiple bank accounts, multiple jurisdictions. So I think like we can spend a lot of time sort of talking about this issue. Yeah. But the overall trend line in the industry is a a steady steady improvement. And True. so I think that's important to observe. Yeah. True. And I think, so I think sort of we're waiting for the institutional money to come in and that that will trigger the banks to, to make the final switch. I, just, I think to, the, just to note that uh, for anyone who didn't read it, the European Banking Authority, yeah. in their report, they said explicitly, um, although financial institutions can't hold Bitcoin per se, mm. they said explicitly that they could still, as a credit institution, open 
bank accounts for Bitcoin businesses. So, you know, we've got it from the EBA on paper that there's no reason for a bank not to open an account for Bitcoin business. So that is a positive trend. And I'd just like to pick up, you mentioned this point about regulatory uncertainty, you know, in, in the Netherlands, mm. i.e. you could register with the financial authority, right. but they couldn't. So therefore, they could not legitimize their business. Exactly. And that puts them on the back foot if they are approaching cheap partners. Yeah, so they know it's going to happen, sort of a European uh, legislation or regulatory uh, environment will be in place at some time. So they're now trying to, to prepare themselves as well. Um, uh, but the companies like us that were able to do that from the get-go, they're already in a better shape. So now they're getting sort of catching up and, and shaping themselves up to be ready for when that regulation comes. Uh, but it also affects, again, the bank accounts, especially in the UK, I would say, uh, where you go to the regulatory uh, body to, to get a registration that say no. And then the bank said, yeah, but you need to have a registration in order to get bank accounts. So it's like a chicken egg, catch-20 sure. situation. Let's talk a little bit about that regulatory uncertainty. You said that you know, the FCA weren't prepared to offer a license or yeah. the opportunity for you to acquire authorization. What do you perceive that as a challenge in its own right, not being regulated? Or would you say in, in, to a certain degree that's an advantage? Forgetting about the banking situation, but just inherently in that. Well, actually, uh, it's, it's hard to forget about the banking situation. I think the main advantage of being regulated is a, ba a bank account will, will come much, much, much more easily. Uh, on the other hand... From a regulatory perspective, there are a number of institutional funds and, and institutional clients that would be much more comfortable dealing with us if we were regulated. Um, so on, on one hand, there is that. On the other hand, um, I, I guess there are some advantages of being unregulated, although for the most part, I don't, I don't think that's a big factor. We are preemptively regulatory compliant. We basically, when we, when we applied to the, to the FCA, we had to become compliant to do that and build a, build a policy and a kind of internal control structure to, that was compliant. And so for the most part, we're operating in a compliant fashion. So it's, it's, not, ex, it's not really going to be extra overhead in terms of the way we see it. Um, Okay. Regulation would basically be more of a, a certification that we are doing the things that we're claiming we're doing. Okay. And so to the extent that that would benefit customers, whether they're institutional clients or retail customers, that would be well appreciated and we, we, are, we would wish that they would have changed their answer. Okay, so there's maybe a, a business opportunity in having a license or authorization. Yeah. You can scale up your business with institutional clients. But listen, let's explore a little bit about the retail clients. We yeah. mentioned earlier about this idea of consumer protection. Um, you know, and you know, the Mt. Gox fiasco um, creates, let's say, you know, consumers are scared of depositing yeah. their money with exchanges. And the unregulated environment, to, an, to a certain extent, is not sufficient to address those concerns. I mean, can we talk a little bit more about consumer protection and what you, as, as a challenge, essentially? Yeah, I think one of the important things to remember here is that we are in a stage in the industry where the endpoints to the world we're trying to build are tricky. That is improving over time, as I said. But it's important to remember, because we get lost in the weeds on this a lot, we're, I'm here, certainly, and I hope most people are here because we're building a new financial world. We're reimagining the way we all transact. Yes. And we're making things much better. And I think that if you stay committed to that, you have to stay committed to the long-term vision. Part of that is, well, once consumers are in this system, it's completely unregulated at this point. And what happens to them? You know, to date as an industry, we haven't done so well in consumer protection. You know, there's been a laundry list of meltdowns, of thefts, internal and external mismanagement. Um, you know, and I've been caught in several personally. I know most people I know that have been in Bitcoin for some time have been caught in several. And so I think that we have to do better on that front. And one of the reasons that we haven't done so well on that front is that when people design these endpoints and exit points, a lot of times, you know, there's been a centralization of funds. You know, one of the interesting things, I was talking to the guy, a guy who's, um, who's formerly the CEO of uh, Citigroup, and he told me, you know, the history of finances has told us anytime you create a target, anytime you pull value, people will go through all manner 
of effort to try to steal it. Now, for Citigroup, that wasn't such a problem because people would hack into Citigroup, transfer the money out, they'd recall the wire. In Bitcoin, there is no recall the Bitcoins function. You know, that hasn't been built into the protocol, and I doubt it ever would be. And so once someone gets into it, breaches you, either from a hardware level, software level, or a purely operational level, if you've centralized or pooled consumer funds, you're going to lose them. And there's all kinds of ways to be breached. It's basically limitless. And we've seen that play out again and again and again. Um, and that's deeply troubling as an industry that's very young that we've already lost so much in consumer funds. Mm. So how, how would you go about, let's say, addressing so this, this challenge of centralization? Maybe we could... Yeah, sure. So, so at blockchain, we're extremely committed to not centralizing funds. We never have. We have no control over users' funds, no way to access your funds. And if we're breached on any of those levels, either at a hardware level, operational level, or software level, our own accounts may be breached, but your account will not be. And that's one of the key things that we're committed to because what it does is it controls our risk profile. So instead of our risk scaling over time with growth of customers, our risk stays pretty flat. What we'd like to see the industry do is things similar to what Cefalo is doing. So Cefalo is running this ability to get Bitcoins, <clears throat> but they're never storing your Bitcoins in a centralized pool. Um, they're actually building their own wallet right now that doesn't centralize. And you know, I think that's a positive development. So it might just be interesting to hear Frank talk about that because we don't actually sell Bitcoins. <laughs> yeah, yeah, okay. Well, let's, let's hear Thank about you, that, Frank. <laughs> um, well, yeah, I obviously fundamentally agree with that approach. It's like uh, as, as soon as you centralize, you become a target. And there are enough examples in the industry that that has happened. Uh, so we made a conscious decision to not store any Bitcoins and work with liquidity providers to execute the trade straight on without any holding it. And a similar approach we're taking to the wallets, although... I'm not inclined to say too much about what we're doing there, but uh, um, yeah, we, we, we certainly see an advantage in, in making it not uh, accessible directly by us um, and also not holding it one common wallet. So. And, and Mark, would you perceive this to be a problem and how, how have you addressed it? Yeah, so as an exchange, we have to have full control over a customer's Bitcoin when at the point that they are placing a limit order or a market order on the exchange. Um, now, what we're doing in terms of protecting the client funds is essentially, even though we control the Bitcoin, we're not centralizing it. We're not holding any Bitcoin on one, one private key or there's, there's no single... Yeah, but single... to be fair, even Mt. Gox didn't hold all their Bitcoins on one private key. They held it spread. You, you're uh, misunderstanding what I was say saying. No, none of our Bitcoins are hold, held on single signature addresses. Right. So like Bitstamp... Uh, Kraken, and every other exchange holds funds in single, single signature private keys um, or signal, signal signature addresses. Mm. We hold 100% of client funds. Once they're deposited, we hold 100% of client funds in multi-signature pay to script hash addresses where the keys are held in different bank vaults. Actually, not banks, but different vaults. Um, and can just two quick questions there. One... How does that prevent you from being breached on like a hardware or operational level? And two, how can I independently verify that you're adhering to the security protocol? So you can tell any time you've deposited the funds, and and once uh, you can see that that they're they're moving to a uh, pay to script hash address, and then when you see a transaction going into or out of that pay to script hash address, um, on the into you see it's a pay to script hash, and on the output transaction you see that it's been signed by three signatures. How do I know who controls the signatures, though? Well, that's, there's, no, there's no... We don't have any way of, of you knowing who controls the signatures. So you, one person could, in fact, control all three signatures. Yes, but you can... It, it is a definite step up above what other exchanges are doing where they're holding funds But on. to be clear, I need to trust that you don't control all three signatures. Yeah, any, any exchange will require trust. So the challenge is how you can use technology uh, to address the lack of trust exactly. in third parties, which is an irony of Bitcoin being a trustless uh, remittance system. But to I, a certain I, I degree. think we can solve this from a software level. Okay. As things come along, you know, you work on solutions for multi-custody wallets. I think some of that work is extremely fascinating, um, and there's companies, uh, including ourselves, who are working on this kind of technology that would allow people to have joint custody of accounts. 
Um, and obviously, it's possible to do. Like, you don't have access to a full order book, but Cephalo never holds, never holds your Bitcoin. No. Um, and I think we've got to get there, and we've got to keep committing to solving these problems from a software level, or we're going to continue to see these meltdowns and losses of consumer funds. Okay, great. So I agree with that. We've looked at, looked at some of those challenges. Now, I'd like to come to the audience and see, you know, whether there's, you know, any challenge that you've had that you want to relay or any questions that you have um, about the, you know, a description. Whether you've experienced something similar in obtaining a bank, trying to get a bank account open. Does anyone want to make any comments? Not really. No? Yes? At the back. So, um, Dennis and Bertram, uh, a turn of cryptographic. A uh, number... Oh, sorry. A number of years ago, I ran one of the first Bitcoin exchanges in the Czech Republic, which allowed for you to instantly deposit um, Czech crowns into our exchange and then trade them for uh, Bitcoins. We ran into the problem relatively quickly of fraud, where they have a, a secure system of online banking, but it isn't so secure as to prevent old ladies from being socially engineered by whomever. So really quickly early on, we ran into people who were sending money to the exchange to us when they didn't actually intend to send the money to us. And the bank initially told us that they didn't really care because the, the transactions had been confirmed from their end in terms of their um, two-factor authentication, so it was fine. Of course, a few months later, the, the story changed and we eventually closed because the, the Ministry of Finance had a big issue with how they were going to handle Bitcoin, and the bank, of course, was just not happy with us in general. So one of the things that in the smaller countries, and working with other individuals who work in Bitcoin companies in smaller countries, is, is that the banks have been very leery. They're, they almost are waiting to see what the larger countries do with regards to regulation in Bitcoin before they make any clear rules. So um, except some places like Slovenia, I feel that a lot of these smaller countries are in this just holding pattern where even though you could develop something really unique in, for example, the Czech Republic, you don't have the legal framework where the government won't give you any promises in terms of what the future is going to be. Okay. And so... Okay, interesting. I, I think that you picked up a very key issue here, which is fraud. You know, um, you know, an exchange whereby you're accepting card payments with the possibility of chargeback mm. is a massive challenge. I mean, the online gaming industry had loads of fraud and they spent years trying to deal with it. Have you ever considered, you know, beyond bank transfers, whether you're going to accept payments via card? Well, we have direct payments, right, from 87 banks in 11 countries. And, um, I mean, this is the biggest challenge to make sure that you know who the customer is and do the KYC. And yeah. it's, it's quite extensive if you really want to make sure that you don't, uh, 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 that you're not getting fraud in your system. Um, and uh, there are different layers that you have to implement to make sure that you, the person is who they say they are. And then uh, you, we will actually minimize, I mean, sure, we've seen fraud cases as well, but it's really minimized to, to the amount of cases that uh, take place. Um, and it depends which method you use as well. Some are more prone to, to fraud than others. Um, uh, so it's, it's, and, you know, we don't use credit cards. Uh, there you have more uh, chargeback risk than, for instance, with the direct payment methods that we use. Uh, and we partnered with uh, Yumio, a company that, that does the, the verification with uh, the recognition of the different IDs. Uh, so these are the type of uh, things that we Great. try so, to do. So KYC way. for you, know your client, yeah. is not only important so you don't stay out of jail, but secondly, it's important from a fraud perspective to reduce your fraud risk. Absolutely. And then whatever technology parts you can do on the back end, uh, that's where we spend most, most of the time up in the first phase of Cephal to make sure that we have that, that basically locked down. What, what's your view, Mark? Uh, it's, it's a lot of the same KYC pro procedures. We, uh, we check everyone's documents and do an electronic check of all of our clients. Whenever funds come in from their, uh, that, that are referencing their reference code, we have to check that, that it's coming in from their bank account and not a third-party account, not someone else trying to you know, wire funds to the exchange to launder money or commit fraud. So it, it's, it's a number of kind of in financial industry standard policies around, around fraud and just procedures to, to kind of mitigate that and make sure none of it happens. And of course, 
making sure that the only payment mechanisms you use are ones that don't have any chargebacks. Because you can have the best KYC procedures in case, and someone can do a chargeback, and you're out money. So that's and, and basically what I mean, doing. for wallets, what kind of fraud risk uh, uh, do you yeah, foresee? Yeah, we, we don't really have a lot of yeah. fraud risk, but I will jump to the regulatory question. You know, it's kind of a two-part question. Yeah. You know, I think that we've seen the regulatory environment change a lot over time. It has a tendency to spike up and down. So a lot of regulatory interests and not a lot. The, the most important thing, in my view, is that you decide who you are as a business, what you are committed to achieving and what you are committed to building, yeah. and then be open both with consumers about who you are, what you're doing, and what you care about, and be open to regulators as well. I'm not saying that you should, um, you should accept every regulatory suggestion, but I'm saying that you should figure out who you are, stay committed to that, and you should also tell them what you're trying to do. And you know, hopefully, hopefully you can reach some sort of understanding um, and some sort of uh, business model that lets you operate. But it's a really long game. And it's important not to uh, get kind of caught in the weeds of every specific announcement that crosses your Google News alert. All right, you guys can have cocktails now after Premier's finished. But thank you very much. Cool, Thanks thank you. Guys. Thanks, guys. That was great. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks so much for listening to our coverage of Coin Summit. If you enjoyed this episode, please support us with your donation. It really helps us traveling to conferences and produce high quality content for you. You could donate at epicenterbitcoin.com slash tips, where we have our tipping addresses and also an option for donation subscriptions. Your support is much appreciated and special thanks to those generous souls who have already donated to the podcast.